now, The Good Fight with Yasha Monk. Hi, this is Freddie DeBoer. I recently wrote a piece for Persuasion titled Humans Suck at Seeing into the Future. It's an argument about artificial intelligence using the lens of the growth of nuclear power and then the death of nuclear power in the 20th and 21st century. It's an argument about the contingency of history and that we can never really tell from the past what's going to happen in the future. I wrote this piece because I feel that the mainstream coverage of artificial intelligence has been wildly irresponsible in that it tends to be divided almost purely between utopianism, so AI will save us all, and apocalypticism, AI is going to kill us all. I think the reality is almost certainly in between those two extremes and that AI will be a powerful set of technologies, but that they won't fundamentally alter the basic human experience. Freddie DeBoer's piece called Humans Suck at Seeing into the Future was published by Persuasion. To learn more about the community we're building at Persuasion and to get similar articles directly into your inbox, head to www.persuasion.community. My guest today is Greg Lukianov. Greg is the president of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, an organization I greatly admire for stepping into the breach of defending the First Amendment and free speech in a clear and principled way when some other institutions have recently failed to do so. And he is also the author of a number of really interesting books, including with Jonathan Haidt, old friend of a podcast, The Coddling of the American Mind, and soon forthcoming, The Cancelling of the American Mind. We talked about what else, the state of contemporary American culture, and the need for a principled, sophisticated, and full-throated defense of free speech in this moment. Greg Lukianov, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I've been excited to have you on this podcast for a long time. You lead an organization called FIRE, which has recently expanded its focus. And it is trying to stand up for the rights of Americans to be protected by the First Amendment, to have true free speech rights in the country. Why do you think that the threat to our ability to speak freely in the public sphere is so severe at the moment? And where does that threat come from? Oh, man, great question. So we were originally the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, and we were founded in 99 with a special focus just on academic freedom and free speech on campus, and something where I still think that some of the most important battles have been fought and were already being fought for decades by the time we were founded. But we noticed that things had gotten so bad in 2020 and beyond, both on campus, but also in the corporate world, also in journalism, also in K-12, through that we decided after being you know, encouraged to do this for better part of a decade, that we were going to expand beyond Campus will remain central to what we do, of course, but we realized that we had to litigate. We had to, you know, fight in K through 12. We had to fight local legislatures and state legislatures because the culture war had gotten so much worse. And we saw obviously threats from both the right and the left. But worse than that was the sort of bipartisan consensus on the value of freedom of speech tanked and very quickly over the course of about the last decade. Whereas, you know, I still consider myself a political liberal, and I don't mean like a classical liberal, I mean like left liberal. But growing up, it would be weird to not be incredibly radical on freedom of speech if you considered yourself a Democrat or on the left. And that really started to erode in the 90s, particularly on campus. And meanwhile, on the right, there was a libertarian aspect to the American right for most of my life. Certainly not fully, you know, fulfilled, but it meant that you could usually find at least, you know, some Republicans who are pretty good on free speech, or at least a lot of them. All of that is falling by the wayside. Both sides have sort of like a, a left populist and a right populist that thinks that all things are fair in this, you know, existential battle. And free speech has been one of the main casualties. And here's one really important thing. 
If you defend free speech, you're used to people saying this. First, they'll say that they agree with freedom of speech, and then they'll say, but, and then they'll have their exception. I can live with that. That's human nature, even though I'm expansive in my views on freedom of speech. I don't expect everybody else to be. What started to change was that the criticism went from, we all take for granted this is a good principle, you know, at its core, but, you know, we disagree on how it's enforced, to something more like, I think free speech is itself oppressive. I think free speech itself is the problem. I think free speech, it maximizes power, which is, of course, powerful people have always been protected in human history. You only need free speech for the expression of unpopular views in a democracy. Which brings me to one of the things that FIRE does that's a little different than other organizations. We don't just defend First Amendment. We don't just defend the law of freedom of speech in the United States. We defend free speech culture, the norms that actually make free speech valuable. So let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, when we talk about just the law of free speech, I guess I would think that we are in a relatively good position in the United States, in which there's certainly a tax on it, but in which the constitutional guarantee of free speech is sufficiently strong and in which, for now at least, jurisprudence at the highest levels continues to be sufficiently protective of free speech rights that, by and large, we're doing pretty well. Now, obviously, somebody needs to do the litigating when uh, public universities, state legislatures, all kinds of other bodies uh, pass rules, regulations, laws that restrict free speech. Somebody has to be there to say this violates the First Amendment, and make sure that we argue this in front of the courts. But so far, at least, it does not feel like the judicial system has moved away from protecting those rights. That's a very different story internationally. We just had a story in Persuasion, for example, about extremely restrictive laws in Ireland on not just engaging in what's defined in very broad terms as hate speech, but even being in possession of something that could be seen as hate speech. And we see very restrictive laws in other European countries and around the world. But what about the cultural problem? Why do you think that this cultural problem has become much worse? And how would you characterize it? I tried to get at a little bit of this when I co-authored a book called Coddling of the American Mind with my friend Jonathan Haidt. We originally wrote an article back in 2015. And then things got so much worse, we decided to follow up with a book in 2018. And in that, we talk about It's as if someone has given our young people in the United States and indeed our whole society the worst possible advice. And we call this the great untruths. And the the idea of the great untruths are things that contradict ancient wisdom traditions and, and that modern psychology will tell you are bad for you. So the first two are less related to this, but what doesn't kill you makes you weaker is terrible advice to give to somebody. Always trust your feelings. Sounds nice for a second until you actually think about it. Terrible advice. But the one most relevant to what's gone so wrong on freedom of speech, even though both of those two are as well, is life is a battle between good people and evil people. And growing up, I actually thought that America and the whole world indeed was becoming a little bit more morally sophisticated, being able to see sort of, you know, good and evil in different people to different degrees, you know, a greater sort of level of sophistication. But somehow, and I think partially because the culture war has gotten so much worse for a variety of reasons, we've gotten back to a, this is a struggle of good versus evil. And if it's strictly understood as, you know, my fellow Americans are my enemies in an existential sense, it shouldn't be that surprising. There's an attempt to sort of label my enemy's speech as illegitimate, with no value, or indeed harmful. And in my forthcoming book, Canceling of the American Mind, which I co-authored with a brilliant 23-year-old named Ricky Schlott, we talk about how the way we argue on the left and the right is terrible, <laughs> you know, to put it another way. We talk about it as if there's like the minefield and the no man's land, which are all the typical sort of tactics that everybody uses to undermine, you know, quality debate and discussion. And that's like everything from minimization to accusations of bad faith to what I call hypocrisy projection, you know, like basically accusing everybody else of being a hypocrite without actually even bothering to look into it. But on the right, the right-wing version of this, we call it the efficient rhetorical fortress that gives you a sort of presumption that you can dismiss the opinions of experts, of journalists, and of and, and at the very extreme right, anybody who contradicts Trump. But meanwhile, on the left, because a lot of these rhetorical tactics developed on campus, and actually this relates to a theme of your upcoming book, 
step one is you can dismiss just like on the right, you can dismiss people for being on the left. Actually, they don't have to be on the left. You just have to be able to claim that you think they are. And that's the exact same thing on the left as well, is that claiming that someone's a conservative or a right winger has been a tactic to dismiss people my entire life. I'm ashamed that while I was at Stanford Law School in the late 90s, I was a sucker for that. that. Essentially, if you could label something conservative, I felt like I didn't have to think about it anymore. And otherwise, smart people do this way too much. But as you go deeper into the perfect rhetorical fortress, partially because it was developed you know, on campus, it's just layer after layer of ways to dismiss people. And part of those dismissals are you know, about your race, your sexuality, and class to a distressing degree, I think has largely fallen out of it. But as you follow it deeper down, you realize that even if you have all the identity markers that the left claims to like, if your argument is still considered invalid, then it's perfectly okay. For example, for every black conservative that I talked to while doing the book, they said, oh, I've been told I'm not really black if I have the wrong opinion. And it kind of reveals that a lot of this are just tactics for avoiding actually having substantive arguments, which is, of course, deeply harmful to a pluralistic democracy. Well, let's distinguish between two things, though, right? I mean, some of what you've been talking about is just unhealthy norms of political discourse and public debate. And certainly the hyperization of the American public has led to a situation where, especially if you're engaged in some form of political cause or put it more strongly political battle, you don't want in any way to question your own side because it might be perceived as running interference in some kind of way for your political opponent. It's one of the ways in which I think that a system of proportional representation is a little bit better. I'm doubtful that it is the panacea that some people make it out to be. But I do notice in many European countries, you know, if you're on the left and some left-wing political figure has a really bad idea, you can criticize that figure and it's just seen as either a bona fide expression of opinion or perhaps you're partisan of a different left-wing party and you want that political party to be advanced a little bit. People understand that that doesn't necessarily mean you're on the other side. In America, it feels in political discourse often, you know, if you criticize an idea of a Democrat, it must mean that you secretly for Donald Trump. And that's certainly unhealthy. But there is a difference, isn't there, between unhealthy political norms in which we're not getting deep and meaningful debate, in which our ideas are perhaps simplistic, in which we might fall into all kinds of mistakes and traps, and, you know, an actual infringement on the kind of culture of free speech we need so that people can feel that they can be true to themselves, the kind of thing in which genuine concern about free speech arises. So where do you see the threshold? I mean, where do we go from, you know, the stakes of politics are high, and our political norms of discourse are pretty bad. And if you listen to Fox News, or for that matter, MSNBC, or for that matter, CNN, you often think, oh my God, all of this is kind of stupid. I wish they were having a serious conversation to, hey, we're in territory where we really need to be concerned about citizens' ability to express their genuine beliefs. Yes. And so in canceling the American mind, I come up with what I consider to be a very straightforward definition of cancel culture, which also comports with you know my experience watching this happen. Which is very simply the large uptick after 2014 of people getting professionally sanctioned, losing their jobs, being expelled, being fired for what would be normally considered protected expression under the First Amendment. I always have to give the caveat, and I mean, I use it as an analogy to public employee law. I, I try not to get too much in the weeds on that one, but sometimes people, you know, don't want to read the footnotes and actually, you know, find out like what the point is. Let's go into that for a moment, because one of the kind of arguments that I often hear from people who do dismiss free speech, who think that those of us like you and me who stand up for free speech are really just sort of covert conservatives who are trying to somehow further the terrible right-wing agenda, which is a strange thing to think if, if somebody knows something about our work, is, oh, well, you know, these people who talk about free speech, they don't really care about people being able to express themselves. No, really, they just want to say the N-word, or they just want to you know, be able to say terrible things about their fellow citizens. So where is the line? I mean, when you talk about a professor, for example, I'm not talking here about a citizen on the street expressing views. In that context, I have very expansive free speech views in which you should never be at risk of being put in jail for what you say, no matter how horrendous it is. But when we're talking about a professor in a college, I mean, surely if I started to just personally insult one of my students on the basis of their race, it would be perfectly appropriate for me 
to be sanctioned by the university and very quickly lose my job. So where do you draw the line in that kind of context? What should and what is considered an expression of a politically protected view? And where are you using your words in such a way that you're engaging in misconduct as an officer or an employee of the university in a way that your employer should be able to sanction? Sure, yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I try to tie our definition of cancel culture into First Amendment law itself. Not because we're talking about things that are strictly matters of law, but because there's lots of wisdom baked into the way we do First Amendment law. So a professor calling out or or like insulting a student on the basis of race, that would one from the very beginning be considered the kind of unprofessional conduct that could get you in trouble, you know, going all the way back. But also it would fit under the paradigm of, of racial harassment, which is, you know, a pattern of, uh, of discriminatory behavior directed individual that is severe and outrageous. What are the easiest kind of questions? And we see this all the time at FIRE, by the way, are when someone is simply, you know, expressing an opinion or a hypothesis or publishing a research paper. Those are the easiest questions. And to be honest, that's most of what we see. At fire, are people getting in trouble for you know what they say, expressing an opinion online, for publishing research? The fact that I've seen so many retractions in the past five years. When you do academic freedom law, you get very used to the idea that someone will publish an article and then it will be you know roundly criticized, and then there'll be responses to it. But the idea that the article itself gets retracted has been happening at a distressing rate. So let's look at some of like the you know, the actual cases that we've seen on campus in the past couple of years. For example, you know, the targeting of Carol Hooven at Harvard, you know, for arguing that biological sex exists, you know, was something that was not something I would have expected to see, you know, 10 years ago. We had a case at University of California, San Diego, you know, where a professor talked about the Chinese filler word nega, and he was facing being punished after students thought that word sounded too much like the American N-word. And we see cases like this routinely. Another example of what we would, you know, consider worrisome behavior was what happened at my alma mater at Stanford, where students got together to disrupt, shout down, and then an administrator commandeered a speech by a Trump-appointed, very conservative Fifth Circuit judge at Stanford. So I think that the line drawing, you know, particularly when you're able to connect it to some very reasonable standards that exist under First Amendment law, gets a great deal easier. So one argument that uh, critics of free speech like Stanley Fish would make is that if you have to draw a line somewhere, then by definition, it is arbitrary and it is simply expressing the interests of the powerful. That, you know, the moment that you say, well, look, I mean, of course, you can express a kind of opinion about the role that race plays in this country that might be controversial or something like that. But, you know, you cannot personally target a student. Actually, the boundaries between these two things are rather fluid. And so the person who decides where that line is, is simply enshrining the sort of norms which powerful people have an interest in perpetuating. Now, personally, I don't by this argument, I make an argument against it in some of my work, but I'd love to hear you explain as clearly as possible why you think that kind of deconstructionist view about what we're doing when we're distinguishing between legitimate free speech and things that would, for example, be harassing behavior in the classroom is not arbitrary. Yeah, and you explained it well. Stanley and also Robert Post and also people like Jennifer Ruth and Michael Barabe, all associated with the American Association of University Professors, their job is to defend academic freedom on campus, oftentimes kind of rely on people, you know, not knowing a lot about the area to make sort of oversimplified points. So what you're referring to is Stanley Fish's, I think, 1993 book, There's No Such Thing as Free Speech and It's a Good Thing Too, which to be frank, is kind of an embarrassing book to read because it's saying, essentially, because there are exceptions to freedom of speech, those are arbitrary and those are, like you said, going to be in the interest of people in power. And therefore, since you know there is no absolute free speech, then therefore it doesn't exist and let's replace it with other norms. It's not a good argument. I mean, this is stuff you learn like within the first day of taking a First Amendment class, like the idea that like threats aren't protected. The idea that harassment isn't protected, the idea that defamation isn't protected, but there are good rationales for why all of these things 
are not protected. Sometimes it required some serious judicial scrutiny to figure out what those parameters are. Then you get to basic principles, like the most clearly protected form of freedom of speech is the mere expression of opinion. So viewpoint uh, discrimination is considered to be the very definition of inappropriate censorship within First Amendment law. And after that book came out, Stanley started and Stanley and I have been friends in the past, he started actually diving a lot deeper into First Amendment law. And he taught First Amendment law at Cardoza, for example. And I kind of felt like he was rethinking a lot of what he had written in that book. But then he came out with a book called The First back in 2021, which is, I was profoundly disappointed because I felt like it repeats a lot of the same mistakes um, in his earlier work. But it really fixates on this idea that academic freedom and freedom of speech are not even vaguely related. I think he uses language like that strong. And this is an argument that, you know, Robert Post, the former dean of Yale Law School, makes. And then, like I said, Michael Barabay and Jennifer Ruth, you know, make the argument. And it does come down to this idea. Well, they actually do it in the reverse, that academic freedom is not about free speech because academic freedom has a lot of rules attached to it for the knowledge generating process. But that conveniently leaves out the fact that All areas of freedom of speech have rules attached to them. And unlike you'd be unlikely to know from reading Robert Post, for example, that courts handle this just fine. Like the fact that, of course, there are different rules for controlling your own classroom. Professors have the power to control their own classroom. This is something that Post had in a book that he wrote that really said that idiots like us at FIRE would, since we believe in public forum doctrine, where you can't censor people on the basis of their opinion and you can only do time, place, and manner restrictions— Well, that would mean that professors can't control their classroom, which is, of course, a point that is idiotic and nobody actually makes. But you see, particularly in people talking about scholarship, a lot of these kind of straw man arguments that only work if you have poor knowledge of the way the law exists and is enforced. It's a lot less stupid than you would get the impression from reading these very academic works. Yeah, it seems to me that there's a philosophical problem and a political problem with that argument. The philosophical problem is that it looks at something like what philosophers call the sorority paradox and misinterprets its meaning. So famously, and the ancient Greeks recognized this, it's very hard to know when somebody goes from having a full head of hair to being bald. If you keep if you keep removing one hair at a time, it's sort of arbitrary to decide where exactly the line law falls between somebody having a full head of hair and being bald, because any one hair doesn't seem to make a difference. But it would be a very strange inference to make, but there's no such thing as people who have a full head of hair and people who are bald. And so here, I think the reasoning that Fish and others make seem to be analogous. They're saying, look, there are going to be certain kinds of hard cases where we're in a general gray zone between what is a spirited expression of political views and, you know, targeting of a student who has expressed a different kind of view and who perhaps falls in some kind of protected class. No, no, man, no question, no, some professor who is particularly temperamental, who expresses themselves perhaps in a manner that is at the borderline of what is professional, is going to be a hard case like that. And there's going to be, you know, reasonable arguments to be made on both sides as to whether that qualifies as protected speech or whether it's crossed the line into some kind of form of harassment. But to conclude from the existence of those hard cases, so even from the recognition that there's going to be some exercise of political power in figuring out which side of a line that falls on, but there's no such thing as speech that very clearly is just expression of academic research or of opinion that must be protected. Or conversely, that there's no such thing as clearly somebody just attacking a student without expressing any kind of significant political opinion, just targeting them by throwing slurs at them, would seem very, very peculiar. It just doesn't follow any more than it follows from the fact that I'm somewhere between being bald and having a full head of hair, that Bruce Willis isn't bald and you know Justin Trudeau doesn't have a full head of hair. I did want to address one point as well that I didn't get to because I got more excited about some of the technical First Amendment parts of it. A general principle that has been badly misrepresented to a generation of young people comes from the fact that, and this goes all the way back to, you know, before Herbert Marcuse in the 60s, they're not very comfortable with the fact that they're powerful and influential and higher education is a powerful, influential environment that tends to have a super majority of political homogeneity. And this politely gets ignored, but it allows for a situation where you can make this argument with a straight face that freedom of speech is just the argument of the powerful. 
And I have to do this remedial lesson in human history to explain, you know, the history of power and its relationship to freedom of speech. And so you go back to before there were democracies, or not necessarily before, but during the period when there were very few, that the rich and powerful tend to do pretty well, (laughs) like because they're rich and powerful. Generally, money and wealth and power can protect itself. But by the time you get to democracies, money, wealth, and power can still protect itself. But then also the 50 plus percent people of the majority vote are also powerful. So the powerful, you know, still powerful. It's only in a circumstance in which you are unpopular with the elites who run the society or you're unpopular with the majority. Worst of all, if you're in trouble with both, that you need the protections of freedom of speech. And that's one of the reasons why it's not a coincidence that despite efforts to start a women's rights movement going back to the 19th century, a civil rights movement going back to the 19th century, and a gay rights movement going back, you know, decades before it actually happened, weren't able to take off until you started having a strong interpretation of the First Amendment right of freedom of speech. But on campus, you wouldn't know that. You would actually think that free speech is the argument of the powerful. And to me, like, that's partially because higher ed, you know, isn't comfortable with admitting its own influential power. It kind of almost wants to distract from that. Yeah, and that's very related to the second point that I was going to make, which is, first of all, that actually free speech has been the key tool of the powerless through much of human history. In American history, Frederick Douglass celebrated it as one of the great tools of people fighting for the liberation of enslaved people and for civil rights. But throughout the history of the left, most parts of the left have recognized, until they were in power, perhaps in certain places like the Soviet Union, the importance of free speech in order to be able to organize when it was deeply uncomfortable to the powerful. But it's also, in the more contemporary context, internally incoherent as an argument, because the kinds of people who make the argument that free speech is just a tool of the powerful in order to keep down marginalized people often also claim that the United States is a society that is deeply and profoundly and perhaps even irredeemably racist and sexist and transphobic and bigoted. And you have to have a very strange set of views to think that, you know, the United States is so deeply and profoundly unjust and the powerful are so oppressive. And yet there's going to be a regime of limits on speech that somehow happens to be in assistance of the people who are starting up against them, right? So if you genuinely believe that America is such an unjust place, then you have all the more reason to embrace the idea of free speech so that these targeted groups, and they do experience some real discrimination, of course, are able to make the voices heard and to raise their voices. As you've pointed out, they have been able to do, thanks to the First Amendment for many decades, in my opinion, resulting in great improvements for gay rights in this country, for the rights of ethnic minorities in this country, for the rights of women in this country. And that's something that is, you know, distressing to a lot of us. We think that the trend on campus seems to be give power more power because locally we think we can trust power to do right by minority interests. And that's not true of the rest of the world. It's barely even true, you know, on campus because locally on campus, a lot of times what the activists want is actually a locally popular position. But when you have unpopular positions on campus, that's an entirely different story. But I did want to get not to bury it too deep in it. One of the things that is going to be very interesting in canceling of the American mind is that we talk about the data that we've been able to put together at FIRE about professor cancellations. We're still working on student. That's a huge you know, undertaking. But looking into the number of professors who have lost their jobs since we sort of say the honorary beginning of cancel cultures around 2014 is incredibly striking. So just to give some context, when I started, all the cases were about 9-11 because I literally landed in Philadelphia at 9, 10 a.m. on 9-11 <laughs> looking for an apartment. And so all the cases, and they were overwhelmingly coming from the right, you know, where someone had said something really insensitive. My first letter was defending a guy in New Mexico who was famously irreverent, but said in class, anyone who can blow up the Pentagon has my vote. And his career was, he wasn't willing to fight. I and mean, he lost that case, even though fire fought very hard on his behalf. So 9-11 did lead to, you know, a real number of people being fired for having the, you know, the wrong opinion or for saying offensive things. But it ultimately resulted in about five professors being fired from looking back. 
the number of cases that we've seen since the beginning of cancel culture, we're at the stage where by the time the book comes out, there'll probably be about a thousand examples of attempts to get a professor fired. About 60% of those result in professors being punished in some way. And I think around 180 around there result in professors being fired. Now, to put also that in historical context, the number of professors who were fired during the Red Scare from 1947 to 1957, that was about 100 to 150 by the best estimates that we could find. And what's really key for people to understand there is that 57, that end date, was the first case of established academic freedom was protected by the First Amendment. And that law evolved from 57 to 1973. So there's nothing like this going on that we can find in the historical record of this kind of scale of professors being, one, you know, chased out by students. That's a major change. Like the Red Scare was mostly about outside forces trying to get rid of professors, but, you know, having their fellow professors signing petitions against them. And of course, when people bristle this or want to pretend this isn't happening, it's interesting to see how they react to when I point out, and by the way, about 40% of those, give or take, are from the right. Organizations like Turning Point USA, for example, and Fox News, getting people together to petition for professors being fired for saying offensive things. And these are all cases of fire defense, oftentimes successfully. And people are so stuck in the culture war that when you say that fact, one, the conservatives get really mad because they're kind of like, well, that's just people going after truly awful speech. And those are just moderates going after them. And I always have to point out, well, Turning Point USA is not a moderate organization. (laughs) Or on the left, because as soon as they hear that like a substantial chunk of it actually comes from the right, it's like, well, that disproves lefty cancel culture. It's like, no, it actually means the situation is worse for the production of knowledge because professors are getting it every which way. I have a few scattered thoughts here. One is that, you know, there is this attempt to defend what some people call in a slightly Orwellian way, consequence culture, that, you know, people are fired, you know, they experience consequence because they experience reason, but it's horrendous. And so they sort of have it coming to them, right? One thing that's always forgotten about the Red Scare is that many innocent people were ensnared in it. Many people who had views that even in retrospect were perfectly decent, but also a lot of the people who lost jobs and so on, did in fact support in a fundamental way a really bad and evil totalitarian regime in the Soviet Union. That doesn't mean they should have gotten fired. I think we took the right lesson in saying that they should have been able to express their views and they should have been able to hold jobs even for they hold those views. But that doesn't mean we have to pretend in retrospect that the views were always wonderful and lovely. And in the same way, we should be willing to defend people whose views we deeply disagree today. I want to understand a little bit about where people experience the danger of being fired. And I'd love to know a little bit more about that 40% figure, because my basic theory of how this happens, and there's obviously always exceptions, is that you can only be put under pressure from the part of the political spectrum that is predominant in your social milieu or in your institution and your employer. You know, if you are in a industry which is left leaning, or if you are at a university in which progressives outweigh conservatives by 10 to 1 or 20 to 1, it is very unlikely that you will experience adverse consequences if you offend the right. I feel personally that when I have offended people who support Donald Trump, I may have gotten some really nasty emails in my inbox, but I never felt in any kind of way professionally threatened. If anything, it felt like something, you know, that would be social status in my university or in my professional setting, right? Like, look, these terrible Trumpists are going after me. I'm doing something right. It is when I offended people who are more likely to be my colleagues or who are broadly on the left that I felt, oh my God, you know, is this getting into an area where I have to be worried for my job? So it's part of what's going on here that If you're teaching at an Ivy League university, if you're teaching at a small liberal arts college that's very selective, that's sort of a quote-unquote mainstream institutions, you really don't have to worry about cancellation from the right. You have to worry about those terms of cancellation from the left. But if you're teaching at a religious college, if you're teaching perhaps at a state university in Texas or Missouri or some other deep state, then you have to be worried about these attempts of cancellation from the right, but perhaps you don't have to fear as much offending the left. Is that broadly speaking the right model, or do you think that's overly simplistic? 
close, and I'll go through what the data shows us. It is absolutely the case if you look at the top 10 schools in the country, for example, in the United States. Oh, actually, well, one broad thing is that attempts from the left of the speaker, that's the way we count it, because otherwise, since there are so few conservative professors in higher education, a lot of times the professors who are getting canceled are the more sort of old-fashioned pro-free speech lefty types being canceled by the progressives. So that's the way we count the, the directionality of it. And attempts coming from the left are decidedly more likely to actually get you punished or fired. I think it's like something like 70 or 75% success rate. That is a strikingly high success rate. I would not have thought that it was that high. Oh, yeah. Because remember, like the base rate of punishment of some kind is 60%, but it jumps up to 75 if it's from your left. And what kind of punishments are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about everything from extended investigations to suspensions to having to attend ideological training to uh, actually literally having your paper censored or your syllabus censored, the things that are short of being fired. And what kind of likelihood of being fired is there? Of the 1,000 targeting incidents that we're at, it's probably about 180 firings. Sorry, I have to dig down on these numbers, but it's very interesting. Oh, no, no, it's extremely interesting. Nobody really knows all that much about things that happen outside of the top like 400 schools in the country. So that's a little bit of a black box because those don't get picked up by the news media. They're really difficult to find out. But when the threat comes from the right, it's less than half the time are you likely to be punished. And those numbers are affected, like you suspected, by how elite the school is. You're much more likely to get in trouble from the left and to be accused in the first place from the left if you're at a more elite college. And that's blazingly clear from the stuff we've seen. When it comes to some of the threats from the right, there are the silly cases that Fox News latches onto. We had a case at Babson College in Massachusetts where a professor tweeted out a joke about when Trump was saying that they would consider even bombing sacred sites or historical sites in Iran if it came down to war. And he cracked a joke saying, oh, dear Ayatollah Khomeini, and he obviously knew that Ayatollah's long dead. Here are some places that you could attack in the United States that are cultural sites. And then there's like dot, 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 the Kardashian residence, the Mall of America, like an obvious joke. And that got covered as if this guy was actually giving advice to the Ayatollah of Iran about where to attack. And that's just a truly ridiculous case. And that guy was fired. I mean, he has not gotten his job back. And that's a ridiculous case. There are other cases where Dorian Abbott, for example, who was himself facing canceling attempts, he's a scientist out of University of Chicago who had a talk about exoplanets canceled at MIT because of something unrelated he'd written about whether or not universities should hide on the basis of merit. He makes the point that I mentioned earlier that in some cases it's much more angering speech. We had a case that we defended. I think his name was Johnny Lee Williams, and I don't remember what school he was at, but he kept his job. But where, you know, he tweeted out something like the cops should die, like good riddance kind of stuff. And that got huge backlash, particularly as Dorian points out, not just from the right, but from people who would consider themselves more moderate. But, you know, in that case, he actually kept his job. So the contours of what will actually get you canceled and why on campus are, you know, there can be kind of horrifying because we haven't seen anything like it, but they're also in their own way fascinating. So one of the strange ways in which the discourse about free speech has shifted, you pointed out earlier, which is that it used to be that everybody at least paid lip service to free speech. And as the famous phrase goes, hypocrisy is the debt that vice pays to virtue. So, uh, you know, even if you don't fully live up to your principles of free speech, the fact that you're at least admitting its importance was a good thing. And so as a result, free speech, which I believe in deeply as somebody who comes from the left, just long been a deeply held value on the left, is sometimes seen in a kind of partisan way as a right-wing value now. When you say, I believe in free speech in many American contexts, it absurdly now sounds like you're seeing you're on the right. At the same time, there's also a very different kind of strain of thinking on the right, of people who effectively have concluded that, you know, since in their view, the left has such a crushing dominance over the media and over cultural institutions and over higher education in the United States, it's not enough to try and fight for some space for conservatives to be able to express themselves on campuses and so on, the right actually needs to use its power in a much more ruthless way to basically start a kind of counter-revolution. And that has inspired attempts most famously in Florida by Ron DeSantis, but also in many other states around the country which have deep Republican control 
to use state legislatures and other kinds of coercive mechanisms in order to effectively censor liberal and progressive views. Tell us a little bit about that development, why that's the wrong conclusion for people who are worried about progressive dominance in certain institutions to draw and how to argue against it, indeed, what FIRE is doing to push against it. And definitely the explosion of, you know, a liberal legislation coming out of Republican dominated and also a case where you know, oftentimes there's a supermajority of power that allows sometimes for this sort of spiraling away of ideological issues. And we've seen a lot of threats coming from state legislatures, limiting sometimes in the form of anti-divisive concepts or as they might have labeled anti-CRT bills. And it is true, the worst cases that we've seen of laws that target freedom of speech and academic freedom have come out of Florida. And it's an interesting range too, including one of the craziest laws we've seen that I think actually made more progress than we ever imagined about if you're critical of the Florida government that you have to you know register with the state <laughs> so people can figure out like who's funding you or whatever. I'm like, that's insanely unconstitutional. Like that's not a close call. There was also DeSantis himself was talking about lowering the protections afforded journalists under the New York Times v. Sullivan defamation standard, which would make it easier to prosecute journalists for just saying mistaken things about politicians. And of course, I, I think of that. I'm like, are you nuts? That's going to backfire on you just as much as anybody else, even your self-interest. That doesn't make sense here. And then, of course, there are the laws that are directed at higher ed itself. When it comes to the issue of who controls K-12 curriculum, that gets a little more complicated because state legislatures are in public schools, mandatory attendance. It is you know, part of constitutional law that there is governmental say in those kind of decisions completely different when you talk about higher ed. And the divisive concept bills took the form of the Stop Woke Act 1 and 2 that we fought in court. And this was something that, that specifically said, like, topics you cannot advocate for in higher education. We were trying to find plaintiffs for a while before we actually were able to get them. But I was shouting to high heaven, like, this is unbelievably unconstitutional. I've seen, like, a lot of unconstitutional laws in my 23 years at this point at fire, but this should be laughed out of court. So we finally got plaintiffs in that. We challenged it. So did the ACLU and we defeated Stop Woke One. And by the way, like sometimes like it's funny, sometimes hearing from conservatives when we call it the Stop Woke Act, they're like, well, you know, call it something else. Like that's what it was labeled by the media. And it's like, no, 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 that was the preferred name. It's an acronym that stands for something. I forget what. So there's a even at least as bad Stop Woke 2 that has been passed by the Florida legislature, and we are going to be challenging that one as well. And one of the things that is sort of funny about this is that when it comes to higher education reform in the United States, I believe passionately in it. I think it propagates upper class kids. I think it maintains class privilege. I think it's too expensive. I think it's too bureaucratized. I think it's too ideological. I think there are a million problems with American higher education um, that actually I think are very responsible for a lot of what Peter Turchin points out in his, in his recent book, End Times, about elite overproduction, but also the way that I think actually American higher education makes it very difficult for the American working class to cooperate because it's so much focused on racial identity. It, it prevents an identity idea that, you know, working class people can actually work together. So I believe a lot about higher education reform. But if you pass something unconstitutional that limits academic freedom, we will fight you every step of the way. And so far, we've also won every step of the way. Yeah, I mean, what I found striking about one of the iterations of these laws that advanced relatively far, you may be able to recall the details better, is that it would have outlawed the teaching in public universities and colleges in Florida of anything considered identity politics or critical race theory. Now, it's not the sort of one-sided teaching of these things or the requiring students to pay lip service to these things. I think there are some genuine concerns about that happening in certain classrooms. It was just the teaching and assigning of any text which may be regarded as constituting identity politics or critical race theory. Now, I'm somebody, as my listeners will know, who's critical in many ways of both identity politics and of aspects of critical race theory. But I teach a course, not in a public university in Florida, in which I have a week on free speech, in which students learn quite clearly what my view is, which is that of a defender of free speech. But as somebody who does not want to be a propagandist in the classroom and who wants to give my students the tools to think through this subject 
in a serious way, I of course, also assign some of the text on the other side. I have a week I teach on cultural appropriation in which, again, I make it clear that I think uh, the way in which this concept is used is often uh, very overbroad and it ends up problematizing uh, forms of cultural exchange that are fundamental to human progress. And in fact, one of the beautiful things about living in a diverse society, but I also assign some interesting, smart philosophical texts that try to figure out why in their mind cultural appropriation is in general a problem. So I would not be able to teach this course as I read the law in a public classroom at the university level in the state of Florida. And that truly seems absurd. Yeah. And meanwhile, you actually hit upon, like, for example, one of the laws that we have absolutely no issue with and that was kind of like roughly thrown together with divisive concept bills. That was a law in North Carolina that says you can't require students to espouse or commit themselves to the following ideologies. And it's like, well, yeah, there's nothing unconstitutional about that. And in fact, actually, constitutional law is very clear that you can't compel speech. You can't make people say things they don't believe. And hell, you can't make them say things they do believe. You can't make them do that. So that's a version of what you're getting at, where it's kind of like, yeah, that, that actually just backs up existing sensible you know, First Amendment law. It was interesting to point out in some of these cases that by banning the use of any materials from 1619 makes it pretty difficult. For example, if you think that 1619 was wrong on some of its portrayal of, of history, as I certainly do. But how exactly are you going to like talk about that at all if you can't actually refer to all the materials? So it's poorly thought out. It's a liberal. It's a dangerous and foolish path to go down. But, you know, the good news is at least so far when we fought it, we won. So, Greg, we are obviously agreed that these laws are terrible attacks on free speech and academic freedom in this country. What I'm less sure about is how concerning they are in practical terms, because it does seem so far like, thanks to the advocacy of organizations like yours, and thanks to the fact that the tradition of First Amendment jurisprudence continues to be pretty robust in American courts, these laws are being found to be unconstitutional. Are there some of these laws that continue to be on the books for a long time because we can't find the right plaintiffs? Is there some danger that the Supreme Court may start to change its mind about that? How big a threat are these laws in the medium or perhaps the long term in terms of the ability to actually stay on the books and affect what happens in the country? And that's a good way to put it, is talk about the short, medium, and long term. On the short term, of course, you know, sometimes professors will actually get in trouble for, you know, saying the wrong thing when the law is actually still in effect. In the medium term, the good news is the First Amendment law is really good on this stuff. And that essentially, if you pass things that violate academic freedom, you know, one, bring it to fire, we will litigate and we'll probably win. So th there's reason to be optimistic about fighting back a lot of the attempts to limit free speech in higher education. It does get a little more complicated as you get into K through 12, like I said, because legislatures are traditionally involved in deciding what curriculum for K through 12 is. And it does get a little more complicated when you talk about, say, K through 12 libraries, because the most important case on point in that is a case called PICO that was from 1983 that's, I think, almost certainly an opinion that would be overturned under the current makeup of the court that basically said, even though you can decide, you can make all sorts of judgments in what books you put into K-12 through libraries, you can't remove books just based on hostility to the political viewpoint of the books. Now, of course, it left entirely open the idea that you can remove books on the basis of age appropriateness, for example. So th that's an opinion that I think is vulnerable. But overall, when it comes to particularly where the rights are quite clear, I think the current Supreme Court, including on the left, is very good on freedom of speech. And so I hope not to be proven horribly wrong here because it's always possible, but that I think that the medium and long term likelihood of these really frontal attacks on freedom of speech to survive legal challenge is very low. So in the last weeks and months, there's been a little bit of chatter about some of these forms of cancel culture starting to run their course, or at least there being some amount of spirited pushback against the most extreme forms of it. In Stanford, we had this case that you invoked earlier of a federal judge being shouted down by law students, seemingly aided and abetted by a dean for the university who was present in the classroom. 
but subsequently, the dean of Stanford Law School, the other one had been a sort of assistant dean or associate dean or something like that, wrote a letter to the law school community laying out free speech principles in a very detailed and I think quite forthright way of the course of 10 pages. I don't know if you have some quibbles with this page or that, but it seemed to be broadly a clear endorsement for the need of free speech. There are similar cases in Brown and a few other places. I suppose I am a little less sanguine about how much progress we're making. It seems to me that the most extreme and laughable forms of restrictions on free speech are perhaps subsiding a little bit. You mentioned earlier the case, I believe it was at the University of Southern California, of a professor, not coincidentally, in June 2020, lecturing about how to hold a good presentation in the boardroom, saying, you know, it's much better to have a pause in speaking and to hold the tension rather than put in these filler words like well and arm and so on. That's what really makes you lose authority. And being conscious of the fact that he had about a third of his classroom being Chinese students, he then gave an example of this Chinese filler word. It was one of the most common words in the Chinese language, which has some remote similarity to the N-word in English. And he was denounced by his dean and investigated and put on leave and all kinds of terrible things. And that would be much less likely to happen today than it did two years ago. But at the same time, I worry that the sort of way in which people have internalized red lines that you don't want to go close to, that they've internalized that when somebody crosses one of those red lines, it's perfectly normal and appropriate that they should be punished. Even the way in which it's become completely normalized, that I have lunch with people who are left-leaning, pretty progressive people, and who will express some quite milquetoast opinion to me, and then follow that up without thinking about it much by saying, of course, I would never say this publicly. All of that seems to me like it hasn't gotten that much better. And so I guess I'd love to hear your thoughts on where we're at in this battle and what it would take to actually advance and promote not just legal protections for free speech, but a true culture of free speech in the coming decades. Yeah, it's a big job. About a third of canceling of the American mind is about potential solutions, but I'm under no illusion that this is going to be an easy fight. And when it comes to the idea that cancel culture is over, I also take it with a grain of salt because one, we also know the data. And yeah, it's true. The rate of professor cancellations is not as bad as 2020 or 2021 so far, but it's still really bad. It's still worse than it was in 2018 or 2017 or certainly 2016 or 2015. And we saw more shoutdowns um, th this past year than we've seen in quite some time. And whereas Stanford's response to it at least was good, none of the students were punished for the shoutdown. The San Francisco State University, in their case, where it was an even more aggressive shoutdown, and there's claim that the speaker in that case was actually assaulted. San Francisco State University basically came out and praised the protesters in that case, which really, that I'm certainly not used to seeing. And for that matter, we should Keep in mind that even though there were shutdowns at places as prestigious as Harvard back in the 70s, when it comes to elite law schools, particularly you know those in like the, the top 10, I don't know of parallels to what's happened just in the past two years at Yale and Stanford. This is you know unheard of. And I'm still being told that this is ending. And here's my historical perspective on this. In the 80s and 90s, you had the free speech movement in 1964 at Berkeley. And by 1974, you had these tremendous wins for the free speech movement on campus in the Supreme Court, one of the fastest movement to success rates in American history. And then by 1984, 1985, you started having schools across the country passing speech codes, passing uh, restrictions on racist, sexist, hurtful speech all of which were found to be unconstitutional as soon as they were challenged, all the way up until, once again, at my alma mater, Stanford, in 1995. At the time, we were sufficiently united of a country that, on the left and the right, this was criticized. Political correctness on campus was a butt of jokes. It was criticized by you know, uh, Republicans and Democrats alike. It was, you know, uh, criticized in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. There was broad-based support for the idea that this is a problem. 
And because the final code was defeated in 1995, there was a sense that, oh, thank goodness this is over. Because political correctness became the butt of jokes, there was a sense that this had ended. And partially because the students who started showing up on campus in the 90s were actually better on free speech, which they continued to be until about 2013, 2014. And the professors kind of got disenchanted with it as well. There was a sense that it fizzled a bit with the students and the faculty, which I think is true. It didn't fizzle with the administrators. And when I started in this job in 2001, I felt like I spent a lot of my career being like, this is actually much worse than you're currently being led to believe. It's much easier to get in trouble for what you say on campus than certainly than it should be. And certainly than people seem to be aware. You'll still see people who try to pretend this isn't happening at all. Looking back at the 80s and 90s and saying, oh, well, that was a moral panic and nothing really happened there, while ignoring the fact that there were multiple court cases overturning the kind of codes that were passed. But we didn't have really meaningful reform in the 80s and 90s to try to address some of this stuff. And one thing that people don't know is actually the speech codes, even though there were those many defeats, there were more speech codes by the time I started at FIRE than there were back in 1995. By the time we actually got all the data together, we found about like 75% of schools had what we call red light speech codes, which are laughably unconstitutional codes. And we have been able to help there by lots of lawsuits and lots of attention. The number of those kind of speech codes have been defeated. But bias-related incident programs where you can anonymously report your fellow students and your professors in many cases, those are all over the place now. So I think that we need much more serious commitment to actual reforms for higher education. I think we need institutions that actually are better insulated from public pressure that can help us you know, have more confidence in what our experts are actually producing. Because, and here's the most pernicious thing about cancel culture, is that it leads very quickly to an American public that says, wait a second, if I've heard a single story of one of you experts get losing their job over having the wrong opinion on whatever it is from like COVID to public policy to whatever, of course, like the trans issues is, is some of the most r- radioactive stuff. If I hear about even one example of someone actually like losing their job or being threatened with losing their job, that makes me aware of the fact that there's huge social pressure for experts to actually conform their opinions. And one of the major points for making and canceling the American mind is that it's devastating to people's trust and belief in experts. So I've even been thinking about attempts to recreate ivory tower institutions that are better insulated from public pressure that can actually be more relied upon. Because I left doing the research for canceling of the American mind, quite cynical about how much you can actually trust research coming out right now on politically radioactive topics. So I'm sure you've convinced many listeners that this is a problem. What can all of us do to try and protect and stand up to and recreate a genuine culture of free speech in higher education and beyond in the United States? The single most important thing that we have to do is actually cultural, and it's reviving the norms of a free society and of a free speech culture. And I say reviving because those of us who grew up in the U.S. decades ago, there are some very simple idioms, very simple sayings that really captured a lot of what it means to believe in free speech culture. Among them, very simply, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. And things that were repeated all the time, like it's a free country, ideas of empathy embodied in the idea of before you judge somebody, walk a mile in their shoes. For that matter, don't judge a book by its cover when it comes to the identity politics aspect of it. A lot of these simple sayings have tremendous amount of wisdom for what it means to live in a free, pluralistic democracy. So one, it has to be okay to say some of these things. Step two is adapt to the terrible way we argue by fighting back against stuff that we know are BS, our argumentation topics. You know, like the idea that just dismissing someone because they're a lefty on their opinion is a ridiculous thing. Nothing about their political identity means they're necessarily wrong. And just the same way, the fact that intelligent people in the United States, and I was guilty of this myself, could take the fact that just simply labeling something conservative meant you didn't have to think about it anymore is something we could get rid of tomorrow. So we really have a lot of problems to get solved, but we will never get there unless we actually get back to or at least prop up some of the habits that actually help you get to truth rather than simple you know, political victory in battles. And those are things that requires individual bravery in some cases. But I think that all of our polling is showing us that most Americans, right, left, center, black or white, actually really love freedom of speech. So I think there is a pent up desire to get back to the idea of kind of like, listen, everyone's entitled to their opinion. Can we at least all agree on that? And I'm hopeful that we can. 
Greg Lukianov. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to The Good Fight. Lots of listeners have been spreading the word about the show. If you too have been enjoying the podcast, please be like, rate the show on iTunes, tell your friends all about it, share it on Facebook or Twitter. And finally, please mail suggestions for great guests or comments about the show to goodfightpod at gmail.com. That's goodfightpod at gmail.com. This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Silent Partner for their song, Chess Pieces. Thank you.